It is an absolute waste of time going across the entire internet, correcting every wrong person. That's why I'm going to do it for you. There's a ton of misconceptions when it comes to Log4j, and here is eight of the most prevalent inaccuracies that I've seen when talking about closing the vulnerability or how it's being exploited in the wild. Starting with number one, it's not just web servers that are vulnerable to Log4j. Avenues of attack have been found across a whole spectrum of services because at the end of the day, it's anything which sends information to the log ingester, which is handled by Log4j. Common attack paths right now have been seen in SSID AP names, email headers, usernames on social media or custom web applications, pastebin file names, book review sites, forum post subject names, SMSs, trouble tickets, even pull requests within GitHub repositories are often logged into systems and can issue the attack. The second misconception I'm seeing a lot of is that it works very similar to other remote code execution. And while it's true, you send your payload, it downloads it, it runs it on the server, and then you get a shell back, what's different is unlike other RCEs where you send your payload and you immediately get execution, this can take up to a day to run, depending on how the logs are collected, sent to the ingester, and then ran through log4j, sometimes the execution can take a while. And this is why not all the vulnerabilities are gonna be found right away. The third misconception is that it's easy to find and fix. And while you can just look through your third-party packages and installed software and update all of those for any which have a disclosure. If you do any custom so uh, software development with a big group of developers, it's a fully open source software. Any developer can go, compile it, put it into a jar file and incorporate it in and it's not going to show that it has a vulnerable version. So some of the custom software is going to require manual review to find it. The fourth thing I'm seeing is that a firewall would prevent this or firewall rules would stop this. And this is a really cool one because while it's not true from the outside in, like a firewall is not going to stop from reaching services that are meant to be exposed, a good firewall with rule sets which stop egress might actually stop some of this attack if the rules are set really strict. Because what ends up happening is after the attack goes into the log ingester and into the log4j server, that service is going to reach out to download the malicious payload. So the attack goes in, it's not going to stop it from executing, but it is going to stop that server reaching out to the internet to download the malicious package. And this is one of the best defenses that a lot of companies don't have implemented. Servers like your logging server should never really be reaching out to the internet. Now, there's exceptions to this. It needs software updates, maybe Windows updates or Linux updates or kernel updates or whatever updates it needs. It might need to reach out to the internet. But generally speaking, most servers don't need free access to the general internet. If you had a really good allow list, it would stop the exploitation of the server. So while not a misconception, a firewall isn't going to stop it. It's not gonna be the silver bullet, but it might be a really good defense. The fifth one is so cool and it has to do with incident response. The misconception is that any incident response team should be able to see these connections out. But here's where it becomes really cool. And I talked to one of my friends who works in incident response and I got this back from him. The JDNI string is not actually logged because that's what's interpreted by the log4j logger. So essentially it's like looking for blank spots in your logs. And this harkens back to some really interesting attack paths I've seen, but specifically you're looking for blank spots in your logs or executions. The best way they've been able to see it is by monitoring the egress from the servers. Most servers, again, Going back to my last point, try and reach out so they can try and see if the logging server has reached out, but it's not actually logged. The attack string doesn't show up in most logs. Now there's exceptions to this, but for the most part, it's not just right in the surface, easy to catch. Number six is just because a vendor says they're not vulnerable, doesn't mean they're not vulnerable. And just because a vendor says they're vulnerable, 
doesn't mean they are. This was the case for a couple different packages, like the Unify controller pushed out a fix, but the uh, exploit is theoretical at best. However, other places have said they haven't been vulnerable, yet it's been proven later. There's some interesting vulnerabilities that might be coming out along VPNs. It's going to be so weird when a VPN who says they don't log any traffic starts getting popped by Log4j. It's going to be interesting. We're not that far into the research which has been done on this vulnerability, so I think it's a pretty bold statement, especially given that any developer can grab the class and compile it and incorporate it into the project and it might not just show up. Like it's not gonna be a package that you pull in if you compile it manually. So it's really hard to, diff it's really difficult to know if a vendor's vulnerable or not when not a lot of time has passed for them to do their own research. Number seven is that web application firewalls will fully stop this vulnerability. There's no such thing as a silver bullet when it comes to security and it's a constant cat and mouse game. Web application firewalls work just like antivirus. We push out new rule sets, which stop the vast majority of attack, but there's always going to be bypasses, which get around those rules and then new rule sets come out. So while not a silver bullet, it is a good protection me measure to put in place while we're kind of waiting for a lot of patches to come out. Number eight and the most important one, if you're a pen tester, a hacker, a red teamer, a bug bountier, only test systems that you are authorized to test. In most cases, it is illegal to mass scan the internet. Even when you test systems that are not vulnerable, it is a attempt at a malicious payload on a system you don't own. And it is very easy to trace and it is very illegal for the mo most of the time. Stay safe. If you got information on this video, please give it a thumbs up, caffeinate up and hack on.